pioneer small fry in a language they understood. It was my large privilege a month before he died to hear him tell the beautiful story of Joseph and his brethren to his class without looking at the book. I leave it to the reader to fancy what it was like as it fell, riddled the slang from the lips of that grave, earnest teacher, and was listened to by his little learners with a consuming interest that showed that they were as unconscious as he was that any violence was being done to the sacred properties. Chapter 48. The first 26 graves in Nevada, the prominent men of the county, the man who had killed his dozen, trial by jury, specimen jurors, a private graveyard, the desperados, who they killed, waking up the weary passenger, satisfaction without fighting. The first 26 graves in the Virginia Cemetery were occupied by murdered men. So everybody said, so everybody believed, and so they will always say and believe. The reason why there was so much slaughtering done was that in a new mining district, the rough element predominates and a person is not respected until he has killed his man. That was the very expression used. If an unknown individual arrived, they did not inquire if he was capable, honest, industrious, but had he killed his man. If he had not, he gravitated to his natural and proper position, that of a man of small consequence. If he had, the cordiality of his reception was, guaranteed, was graduated according to the number of his dead. It was tedious work struggling up to a position of influence with bloodless hands, but when a man came with the blood of half a dozen men on his soul, his worth was recognized at once and his acquaintance sought. In Nevada, for a time, the lawyer, the editor, the banker, the chief desperado, the chief gambler, and the saloon keeper occupied the same level in society, and it was the highest. The cheapest and easiest way to become an influential man and be looked up to by the community at large was to stand behind a bar wear a cluster diamond pin, and sell whiskey. I am not sure but that the saloon keeper held a shade higher rank than any other member of society. His opinion had weight. It was his privilege to say how the elections should go. No great movement could succeed without the countenance and direction of the saloon keepers. It was a high favor when the chief saloon keeper consented to serve in the legislature or the board of aldermen. Youthful ambition hardly aspired so much to the honors of the law or the army and navy as to the dignity of proprietorship in a saloon. To be a saloon keeper and kill a man was to be illustrious. Hence, the reader will not be surprised to learn that more than one man was killed in Nevada under hardly the pretext of provocation so impatient was the slayer to achieve reputation and throw off the galling sense of being held in indifferent repute by his associates. I knew two youths who tried to kill their men for no other reason and got killed themselves for their pains. There goes the man that killed Bill Adams was higher praise and a sweeter sound in the ears of this sort of people than any other speech that admiring lips could utter. The man who murdered Virginia's original 26 cemetery occupants the men who murdered Virginia's original 26 cemetery occupants were never punished. Why? Because Alfred the Great, when he invented trial by jury and knew that he had admirably framed it to secure justice in his age of the world, was not aware that in the 19th century the condition of things would be so entirely changed that unless he rose from the grave and altered the jury plan to meet the emergency, it would prove the most ingenious and infallible agency for defeating justice that human wisdom could contrive. For how could he imagine that we simpletons would go on using his jury plan after circumstances had stripped it of its usefulness, any more than he could imagine that we would go on using his candle clock after we had invented chronometers? Chrono <clears throat> In his day, news could not travel fast. 
and hence he could easily find a jury of honest, intelligent men who had not heard of the case they were called to try. But in our day of telegraphs and newspapers, his plan compels us to swear in juries composed of fools and rascals, because the system rigidly excludes honest men and men of brains. I remember one of those sorrowful farces in Virginia, which we called a jury trial. A noted desperado killed Mr. B, a good citizen, in the most wanton and cold-blooded way. Of course, the papers were full of it, and all men capable of reading read about it. And of course, all men not deaf and dumb and idiotic talked about it. A jury list was made out, and Mr. B. L., a prominent banker and a valued citizen, was questioned precisely as he would have been questioned in any court in America. Have you heard of this homicide? Yes. Have you held conversations upon the subject? Yes. Have you formed or expressed opinions about it? Yes. Have you read the newspaper accounts of it? Yes. We do not want you. A minister, intelligent, esteemed, and greatly respected, a merchant of high character and known pro probiety, a mining superintendent of intelligence and unblemished reputation, a quartz mill owner of excellent standing were all questioned in the same way and all set aside. Each said the public talk and the newspaper reports had not so biased his mind but that sworn testimony would overthrow his previously formed opinions and enable him to render a verdict without prejudice and in accordance with the facts. But of course, such men could not be trusted with the case. Ignoramuses alone could met out unsullied justice. <laughs> when the preemptory challenges were all exhausted, a jury of twelve men was impaneled, a jury who swore they had neither heard, read, talked about, nor expressed any opinion, or expressed an opinion concerning a murder which the very cattle in corrals, the Indians in the sagebrush, and the stones in the streets were cognizant of. It was a jury composed of two desperados, two low beer house politicians, three barkeepers, two ranchmen who could not read, and three dull, stupid human donkeys. <laughs> it, <coughs> it actually came out afterward that one of these, these latter <laughs> thought, <laughs> yes, that one of these latter thought that incest and arson were the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> the verdict rendered by this jury was not guilty. What else could one expect? <laughs> the jury system puts a ban upon intelligence and honesty and a premium upon ignorance, stupidity, and perjury. perjury. It is a shame that we must continue to use a worthless system because it was good a thousand years ago. In this age, when a gentleman of high social standing, intelligence, and probiety swears that testimony given under solemn oath will outweigh with him street talk and newspaper reports based upon mere hearsay. He is worth a hundred jurymen who will swear to their own ignorance and stupidity, and justice would be far safer in his hands than in theirs. Why could not the jury law be so altered as to give men of brains and honesty an equal chance with fools and miscreants? Is it right to show the present favoritism to one class of men and inflict a disability on another in a land whose boast is that all its citizens are free and equal? I am a candidate for the legislature. I desire to tamper with the jury law. I wish to so alter it as to put a premium on intelligence and character and close the jury box against idiots, blacklegs, and people who do not read newspapers. But no doubt I shall be defeated. Every effort I make to save the country misses fire. My idea when I began this chapter was to say something about desperadoism in the flesh times of Nevada. To attempt a portrayal of that era and that land and leave out the blood and carnage would be like portraying Mormondom and leaving out polygamy. The desperado stalked the streets with a swagger, graded according to the number of his homicides and a nod of recognition from him was sufficient to make a humble admirer happy for the rest of the day. The difference that was paid to a desperado of wide reputation and who kept his private graveyard, as the phrase went, was marked and cheerfully accorded. 
when he moved along the sidewalk in his excessively long-tailed frock coat, shiny stump-toed boots, and with dainty little slouch hat tipped over left eye, the small fry roughs made room for his majesty. When he entered the restaurant, the waiters deserted bankers and merchants to overwhelm him with obsequ obsequious service. When he shoulders, hit, shouldered his way to a bar, the, shoulders parties, the shouldered parties wheeled indignantly, recognized him, and apologized. They got a look in return that froze their marrow, and by that time a curled and breast-pined barkeeper was beaming over the counter, proud of the established acquaintanceship that permitted such a familiar form of speech as, How are ye, Billy old fell? Glad to see you. What'll you take? The old thing? The old thing meant his customary drink, of course. The best known names in the territory of Nevada were those belonging to those long-tailed heroes of the revolver. Orators, governors, capitalists, and leaders of the legislature enjoyed a degree of fame, but it seemed local and meager when contrasted with the fame of such men as Sam Brown, Jack Williams, Billy Mulligan, Farmer Pease, Sugarfoot Mike, Pockmark Jake, El Dorado Johnny, Jack McNabb, Joe McGee, Jack Harris, Six-Fingered Pete, etc., etc. There was a long list of them. They were brave, reckless men and traveled with their lives in their hands. To give them their due, they did their killing principally among themselves and seldom molested.